Okay, it gives me a uh, great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Marco Lonkar. Uh, Professor Lonkar is the Tian Tsai Lin Professor of Electrical Engineering at Harvard's John A. Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, as well as Harvard College Professor. Lonkar received his diploma from the University of Belgrade in 1997, his PhD from Caltech in 2003 with Axel Scherer, both in electrical engineering. After completing his postdoctoral studies at Harvard with Federico Capasso, he joined C's faculty in 2006. Uh, Dr. Lonkar is an expert in nanophotonics and nanofabrication, and his current research interests include quantum and nonlinear nanophotonics, quantum optomechanics, and nanofabrication. He has received the NSF Career Award in 2009 and the Sloan Fellowship in 2010. In recognition of his teaching activities, Lonkar has been awarded Leventon Prize for Excellence in Undergraduate Teaching and has been named Harvard College Professor in 2017. Lonkar is a fellow of the Optical Society of America and senior member of IEEE and SPIE. He's a co-founder of Hyperlight Corporation, a VC-backed startup commercializing lithium niobate technology developed in his lab. And so um, we'll now have Psychit give a more in-depth introduction. Well, um, I will just add a couple more words. With, uh, thanks for um, Marco for making the time to come here. I just wanted to let everybody know here um, that you know, Marco is um, an integral part of this um, newly formed ERC that you all know about, the Center for Quantum Networks. And uh, I would say Marco is one of the most prolific experimentalists I know, the extremely broad experience. I mean, he is one of the very few people I know who has a very deep understanding of classical and quantum domain physics of light matter interaction, uh, quantum photonics and quantum optics in various different types of integrated photonic platforms and uh, the know-how of uh, very complicated states of uh, state-of-the-art fabrication techniques. So that makes him a uniquely positioned to innovate in this area. He has done a lot of recent work in um, integrated photonics in thin film lithium niobate, looking into applications in quantum manipulations of light on chip, design fabricated um, the uh, the diamond waveguides that 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 recently enabled the silicon vacancy quantum memory assisted demonstration between MIT and Harvard that uh, led to the first demonstration of achieving uh, entanglement generation at a rate higher than what is possible over a fiber. So it was a heroic experiment that Marco was played a key part in. And he's developed some amazing technologies in, including spin phonon coupling methods to support spin-based qubits and, fo and photons to superconducting qubits even. So it's a really pleasure to have you, Marco, work with us um, in our center and a uh, pleasure to have you here today. I wish that we could host you in person for this. Maybe yes. some. So. Thank, thank you so much. I, 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 I guess maybe start where you left. First of all, thank you both of you for this wonderful introduction, uh, especially Saikat. I, I'm honored to uh, have said, received such a kind of words from you. I wish too I was in Arizona right now. I remember like we had our uh, uh, ERC meeting right just in February, just before shutdown or something. Like when was it actually? Something like that, right? Uh, I, yeah. I, yeah. Was, um, uh, last time you were here was for that site visit, right? Was that site um... visit? Yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. And it was yeah, it was a great time. And also even before that, I mean, many many years ago, two thousand five, six, I met Masood when I was trying to convince people that I know what I'm doing around. And Masood was one of the first people to offer me jobs. So I was very honored. Actually, it's good to see uh, Masood and many other friends I met then. Uh, so today I'll tell you a bit about uh, many classical work in this in lithium nanobit photonics. I figured one way or another uh, work that we're doing in ERC, which I'm going to maybe touch upon a little bit in the end. Uh, but, but, but let me let me just say that we were convinced that you knew what you were doing. It was that Harvard was convinced <laughs> also, and we could not convince. I compete with Harvard. <laughs> Thank you, Masu. No, this was a big, big uh, I think you guys were the first one to actually made me an offer, which like I could then sigh with <laughs> a lot of weight over my shoulders. I was just talking to my wife, Evelyn, today. She remembers when we visited. And uh, it was a very nice visit, you know, uh, both. Uh, th Thank you so much, actually, for going with us many, many years ago. And, uh, so, yeah, so mainly it's going to be classical discussion today. and. I hope to have a chance uh, uh, to tell you a bit about our quantum work in Diamond and also the lithium but I'll mention a little bit about lithium hybrid quantum work. And so, so I'll talk about integrated photonics and lithium hybrid. Many of you are probably, if you work in optics, and this is School of Optics, so I'm assuming many of you have touched lithium hybrid modulator that looked a little bit like this. 
Uh, this is Fujitsu One. Uh, uh, and so what uh, technology that we have been developing at Harvard and now it's being commercialized with Hyperlight is actually miniaturizing these modulators so they are much, much smaller and also so that they can be fabricated using wafer scale processing. So that not only makes them uh, uh, less expensive, but also actually high performance, as you will see. And more importantly, you can integrate more, very many functionalities on the chip. And so much of the work I'm going to talk about was supported one way or another uh, by these companies. And there's many companies and many uh, organizations, but they were mainly small grants kind of. <laughs> uh, so it's not a lot of money, actually. And I want to say NSF was the first to recognize that what we are talk, uh, doing is actually uh, very important. And we had a nice co collaborative grant many years ago with Marty Fair that put all of this off the ground. But the one problem that we had early on was actually because lithium lab is such, a, such an old material, people just had very kind of uh, entrenched ideas what you can and what you cannot do with lithium hybrid. So it was most of the effort was convincing people that actually what we did makes sense. So hopefully this is going to be convincing today as well. Uh, so I can mention uh, that we do work in diamonds. So roughly my team is split in two, uh, two main subgroups. Let's say one is a work group the gang, uh, that works in diamond, uh, mainly in quantum space. Uh, there's some work also in 2D materials lately that we were working in Hong Kong Park and Dirk Engel. Uh, the work with Diamond is also with Dirk and Michelle Lukin, uh, Evelyn who is collaborating as well. Uh, and those are guys shown in yellow here. And uh, half of the group that does uh, 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 lithium hybrid work, uh, actually, no, I, I, I confuse them. That, so, so gang that does lithium hybrid work is shown in yellow, and the gang that does uh, diamond is shown in blue. That doesn't really matter. But these are the people that uh, did the work that I'm going to share with you today. So, in case I forget to acknowledge it, uh, here they are. Uh, so, lithium hybrid, as I mentioned, is an old material that uh, people have you been using for many years to realize. Uh, Max interferometer based modulators, phase modulators, that many of us have been using, are using in a lab. And so this is the device that typically looks like, uh, you know, this is Max Zander from it, just for those of you who haven't seen one in a while. Basically, you, you have all the light comes in and one of the guys gets split. This is being split around chip direction coupler. You essentially apply electric field and change refractive index of the light in one of the waveguides and not in the other one, so that when they combine, they can be in or out of phase, which gives you constructive or destructive interference and allows you actually to get light to go in, in one or the, or the two ports. And if you are looking only at one port, then this gives you essentially amplitude modulation because the intensity goes on and off. And the reason why lithium hybrid is so powerful and uh, widely used is because it has very nice second order uh, nonlinearity, Pockel's effect, also essentially electrophilic nonlinearity, uh, which is very fast and uh, very convenient to realize electrophilic devices. Uh, also, lithium hybrid has third order nonlinearity, which is actually pretty comparable to silicon nitride. Uh, but hasn't been used a lot um, till recently. So I'm going to show you some work on third order linearity in lithium hybrid as well. And the main challenge, as I mentioned, with lithium hybrid, why it hasn't really enjoyed much integration and benefiting from high density integration and uh, kind of combining different functionality with the same chip is that actually it's been very hard for many, many years, decades even, to, to scale down the size of lithium hybrid devices. And, and the reason is that actually lithium hybrid is pretty difficult material to etch. Uh, and as a result, uh, people have mainly resorted to making waveguides in lithium hybrid using e e either a kind of proton exchange uh, process or ion diffusion, which basically introduces additional ions in, uh, to define the core. So core then has some somewhat higher refractive index than the cladding. Index contrast is very, very low, which means optical mode is very large. I mean, optical mode is very large. That means you need to put electrodes for your mugs and interferometer, for example, very far away from the optical mode, which that means for given electric field that you need to have to switch modulator on and off, uh, voltage is very, very large. And that results in very large consum energy consumption when you use these modulators for optical communications, for example. Uh, and so one of, uh, of the things we wanted to see is can we actually miniaturize these waveguides, reduce the voltages, and reduce energy consumption uh, and, uh, and then see what kind of applications there may be. And the main challenge, as I mentioned, is actually making devices in etching lithium hybrid because it's an inert material. So, so actually there's a lot of etcher deposition when you, when you try to do reactive ion etching of lithium hybrid. 
And another kind of problem that was around actually lithium ion was only available in bulk uh, for long, many, many uh, decades. But uh, actually right about the same time when we started kind of revisiting this uh, lithium ion platform, this company in China started actually uh, commercializing tin film lithium ion platform. They use essentially smart cut process. Uh, so this is uh, roughly tin lithium ion, maybe half micron thick on top of silicon dioxide on top of silicon. And so these are commercially available wafers up to six inch at the moment. Uh, and so essentially with that now at hand, we were able just to focus on uh, optimizing fabrication recipes, uh, which basically rely on electromagnetography, reactive ion etching, and some post-processing annealing and whatnot. Um, and after many years of uh, work for, by this student, Cheng Wong, we were able to actually reduce uh, optical losses in lithium ion to about 3 dB per centimeter. And so, and this scattering loss, we thought it was actually pretty good, uh, good number. Uh, it's not as good as some like best working silicon or silicon nitride, uh, uh, but it's limited basically by this roughness you can see. So this is Y splitter on chip. So this is lithium nitride, this is silicon dioxide. And this roughness causes scattering that then reduce, in, introduces these losses. And actually we're very proud of this, but then it turned out very difficult to publish this paper because, um, I guess referees just didn't believe that this, this loss can ever go down and they were arguing this is never going to be technology. And then uh, my postdoc at the time, Mian Zhang, actually decided to prove them wrong, which I, I was pretty excited about uh, this. And uh, in very few short months, but further optimizing edge recipe and post-fabrication techniques, he was able to reduce uh, uh, the loss to 3 dB per meter. Uh, just the optimizing fabrication processes, basically. And this work actually ended up then being published as memorandum in Optica and had, uh, uh, it, it came out before this paper in Optica Express. So often people ask me, why did you, why did your follow-up devices, why did they look worse? Well, in reality, actually, they just got published. It took a year to publish this. It took a month to publish this. So, so thankfully, you know, this is a rare situation where a uh, kind of uh, hard-nosed referee was actually very, very good to us. Uh, so forced us to improve the processes. And so now with this 3 dB per meter, which is I think only second at the moment in terms of optical losses to like some ultra low loss silicon I tried and some really large waveguide cross-section uh, silicon devices, we started thinking, what can we do with this platform? And our original motivation actually was really to look into all optical nonlinearities, particularly for quantum frequency conversion, as I had uh, mentioned in passing. So uh, we were interested in combining our periodic cold lithium nibate uh, devices that I'm going to tell you a little bit about with our diamond devices so that we can take diamond color sensor emission from red to telecom uh, for kind of this quantum repeater application. But then in the process, somewhere we got sidetracked and we really got more excited about this microwave plus optical nonlinearity. So, so because this is where actually you can make some really nice modulators, frequency comp, some, some of you are looking for frequency domain, quantum computing for opportunities, so on and so forth. So, so if I will first tell a little bit about all optical nonlinearities and integrated return IP, but then I will spend actually most of the time talking about this microwave plus optical nonlinearities uh, in, in the same material platform. So the first part is motivated is all optical nonlinearities in addition to this quantum frequency conversion. Another thing that we have been working on for a number of years in Diamond as well is frequency comps. And so from that work, we knew, and also from the community, that basically, if you want to make frequency comp for many applications, on-chip frequency comp in particular, for many applications, it's important that you stabilize essentially this comp, essentially that it's kind of, uh, you, you phase lock it. And so, so what that means is uh, you need to have some, typically what you do, you have second order nonlinearity that does that. And I'm going to illustrate this on the next slide. So in second order nonlinearity, whereas most of the comms are made using third order nonlinearity, typically like uh, uh, silicon nitride, silicon, and so on and so forth. And so the question was, can we actually combine lithium ion with second and third order nonlinearity in the same device to provide very nice uh, locking scheme for uh, on-chip frequency comms. So that was kind of actually one of the additional motivations that I'm gonna tell you about now. So the way this uh, kind of locking works, essentially you generate frequency comm and then you take uh, a low frequency, uh, you uh, basically double it and compare it to the kind of frequency at the end of the spectrum. And this comb would have to spend an octave. And then essentially this kind of, these two frequencies in the beat on detector generate a beat node that you can lock into and phase stabilize everything. And as I said, this typically the way this is done, you have, let's say, if you have a mode lock laser, use it as a comb. 
you send this signal through some sort of supercontinuum in order to broad supercontinuum generator, nonlinear wave guide or nonlinear fiber to broaden the comb. And then when you broaden the comb, you actually double uh, using second order nonlinearity. This is third order nonlinearity. You, you, to, broad, to, to log the comb, you actually take one side of the spectrum and double it. And this is done with periodically pole lithium ion in particular. So the question is, can we actually combine these two things, third and second order nonlinearity in the same device and do this in very compact fashion? And real motivation was actually not to stabilize mode lock laser, but to stabilize these kind of micro resonator based frequency comms that I didn't uh, talk much about in the previous slide, but basically this is kind of one of the more, more exciting development on linear photonics, I would say, the realization of these micro resonator based frequency comps that can be demonstrated now in all kinds of different materials. Uh, and, and, and while those comps have been realized, they actually typically use rather bulky optics and off-chip optics to stabilize them. So we really wanted to figure out some on-chip solution to stabilize comp. And the main reason why off-chip uh, bulky optics is needed because these combs typically don't generate a lot of power. So you need to kind of boost powers and do all kinds of in interesting stuff. So anyway, so device is relatively simple. So our device basically is lithium ibit waveguide that is actually this different lithium ibit material platform. And we send uh, essentially uh, optical pulse and as pulse propagate is experienced a second harmonic, a second super continuum generation. So it broadens and then also experiences at the same time second harmonic generation. And eventually these two, if these two are co completely coherent, they, if they overlap, essentially super continuum generation is broad enough, it's gonna overlap with second harmonic generation. And then you can just filter this part of the spectrum, generate the beat note and stabilize everything. So this is kind of uh, all what we are doing. So here's the lithium ion device. Here's super continuum that we generated. We pumped 1500 nanometers. This is also a second harmonic that get generated here to overlap in this region and you send it to the director and you get essentially these beat notes that gives you carrier envelope offset frequency of the comp. So you can use this to phase lock comp basically. And then we did this uh, indeed, uh, we use, use this on-chip device to stabilize mode lock laser. This was done in collaboration with the Alex Gaetas group. So this shows noise from this mode lock laser when it's not locked and when it's locked. And you can see significant improvement in the noise performance uh, when we use this um, on-chip locking, basically. And so we were super excited with this. We kind of need um, about 100 to 200 picojoule pulses uh, to generate super continuum. So this is still pretty high for on-chip uh, sources. So the question was, can we actually further reduce the energies required to generate super continuum in second harmonic so that we can really combine this with the uh, on-chip uh, frequency comps? And the, this is now work in collaboration with Marty Fair, uh, where basically uh, answer is yes. And the way to do this is essentially to do uh, take advantage of periodically pull lithium ion bit, uh, uh, which basically due to quasi phase matching gives you very good uh, second harmonic uh, generation, kind of very, very good second. Uh, it, it allows you to phase match second order processes. And compared to bulk devices, these etched lithium ion periodically pole devices actually can give you a uh, 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 bandwidth that's much larger than what you would get in a conventional device. So this is very exciting. Uh, as you can see here, our, and the reason is when you etch, when you make these nano waveguides, you actually can control dispersion. So not only you're controlling the phase uh, mismatch or uh, compensating phase mismatch between pump and, and second harmonic, but you can actually get the group velocity dispersion to be such that uh, the benefit for efficient conversion is very, very broad. This is very hard to do in conventional lithium ion devices because index contrast is very small between core and cladding. So, so here you can see how our benefit is much, much larger than what you would expect shown in blue from conventional device. But for our kind of super continuum generation, it was another process was interesting. And I have to say, this is something that was actually brought to my attention by Marty Fair, who reminded me that basically in material, the strong second order linearity, where you can kind of control the phase properly, you can get effective third order linearity to, uh, by cascading two second order processes. And it turns out effective third order linearity is proportional to chi two square. And is inversely proportional to phase mismatch. So if phase mismatch between second harmonic and pump is zero, you see that this third order linearity explodes. And so if you can now phase mismatch over broader range, you can get really strong chi three or broad frequency span. Uh, span. 
So, so we kind of wanted to, to, to uh, check that and together with Mark, we basically realized devices that would have a third order, uh, an effective third order linearity, like Kerr effect, Kerr coefficient, two orders of magnitude basically larger than intrinsic Kerr uh, coefficient for lithium niobate itself. And this was done through this phase matching and dispersion engineering of etched periodically pulled lithium niobate waveguides. And what, did, what that allowed us to do, allowed us to have super continuum that kind of overlaps with second harmonic uh, with like, you know, less than 10 picojoules of power. Uh, this was done at longer wavelengths. Uh, so uh, so uh, now we are trying to actually do this at 1500 nanometers, go down to 750 and stabilize basically some fiber lasers. In fact, we have nice collaboration with Vector Atomics and some funding for them. This is a, a company's commercializing atomic clocks. So what they need is very, very compact frequency comps. Uh, and they have a comp, but they don't have compact locking schemes. So we are working with them on actually implementing this. Uh, so, so that's that works. So essentially, the goal is not to combine this uh, 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 with some frequency comps made in silicon, silicon. But also, what you can do actually, you, you don't need to go back to silicon, silicon nitride to make frequency comp. It turns out you can make frequency comp nicely in lithium niobate. And uh, this basically, this very low loss that you have with 3 dB per meter translates to about quality factor of 10 million at, at telecom valence, which is also demonstrated. Uh, which then means if you can dispersion engineer this lithium niobate ring resonator properly, you can get actually uh, potentially uh, into, into kind of, um, uh, you can generate Kirkland. And what I also want to point out that we were able to generate that demonstrate very low losses, very high Q, also in visible frequencies, visible wave at 630 nanometer, more or less the same Q and uh, slightly worse uh, propagation losses. So we took this device, pumped it a little harder, and indeed we were able to generate nice frequency comps. So here we are taking CW laser and we're shooting light to this Kerr comp uh, in lithium niobate, uh, to, to this ring resonator, and we are generating Kerr comp. Uh, for two different polarizations. Uh, these comps at the time were not mode locked, okay? Uh, and the reason is uh, it turned out that actually lithium niobate, like other crystalline materials that you can use to make comps actually have very strong Raman processes. So what happens is you pump, for example, 1500 nanometers, and you generate a bunch of these satellite peaks that are all Raman peaks as discussed in uh, this paper, Raman laser and model frequency comps, it's actually has, has been published, I need to update this reference. Uh, oops. Uh, and so because of that, actually you generate a bunch of small comps that then start overlapping and make this big comp, but they are not, they are not mode locked. Since then, uh, I'll, uh, uh, we have demonstrated mode locked lasers, but more even better result was provided by uh, Chang Lin in Rochester and Hong Tang's group uh, at Yale. Chang Lin was working with Kerry Valhalla. Uh, they were able to demonstrate beautiful solid tone mode locked frequency comps in lithium hybrid by following some of these early demonstrations that we have provided. Uh, in our case, what we were interested actually was this kind of ongoing theme of combining second and third order nonlinearity to the same chip. So we took our frequency comp because it didn't generate uh, pulses and because energy was very high, we couldn't stabilize it. So instead what we did, we did another uh, demonstration that was also important for optical communication application of frequency comps, for example, uh, which is essentially combining modulator and filter with uh, comp. So the idea is if I generate frequency comp starting from CW laser, I generate a bunch of comp lines, then now I can drop one of these comp lines and modulate it and put data on it. And then I can essentially daisy chain a bunch of ring resonators on this input waveguide, modulate uh, each of these rings to have different communication channels. And when I recombine them, I can get very high data rate transfer. So this is something that um, we demonstrated in principle, data rates were not very high because here we were limited by the quality factor of the ring resonator, how fast you can modulate. But this shows, we show the ability to make tunable filter out of this uh, using essentially an electro-optic effect in this ring. And, and we use this ring as a curse comp source that was all integrated in lithium iobate. And then we also were able to put some AC signals here, RF signal and essentially modulate uh, the comp, uh, one of the comp teeth as well. So that uh, brings me to the end of the first part, which is a little shorter part, as I, as I mentioned, but it took half the time. So I, I'm going to maybe uh, uh, try to make, make some, some, some lost time to, uh, in the second part. 
where I will may, mainly be focusing on microwave plus optical nonlinearities, right? In particular, electroptic effect in resonant and non resonant lithium structures. And so here, motivation really uh, was can we uh, realize very efficient optical interconnects for wide range of applications? Uh, in particular, can we, uh, can, is there hope? First, to try to understand what are the limits of current optical interconnects used in uh, in, uh, in data centers uh, that first were being were based on big cells directly modulated lasers. Then people started using these bulky lithium nanobits modulators or indium phosphate modulators. They are slowly being replaced by silicon photonics because of uh, uh, ability to integrate many functionalities on chip and also the, price, the cost uh, is actually uh, driving this down. Uh, the cost is going down and therefore silicon photonics becomes appealing. But actually, as I mentioned later, silicon photonics has many challenges when, uh, when it comes to uh, pushing, like uh, enabling next, next kind of next milestones in these uh, 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 data center communications. So uh, <clears throat> basically, but in addition to data center, there's many other communications strategies that require good uh, electroptic modulators. Uh, so long haul telecom is essentially what allows uh, communication over long distance via fibers, optical fibers. Uh, datacom, I mentioned, uh, it's just communication between different computers and data center. And also increasingly, so wireless communication rely on sending optical signals, so sending signals down optical fiber. So this field of wire photonics is uh, get, uh, becoming more and more prominent. Uh, these days. And all of these rely on essential electroptic transduction, which is essentially ability to take uh, 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 data from electrical stream and encode it in an optical stream, basically. So you have a laser, you have a modulator, you put the electrical signal here, and generate optical pulses. You send optical pulses via fiber. On the other hand, you have a receiver, and then you send these electrical signals into the processor. And so, as I mentioned, there's like at the moment kind of three main technologies, maybe lithium ion bulk old school devices, which are referred to often as to vacuum tubes equivalent to microelectronics are essentially workhorse or long haul optical communication because they give you the highest, the best performance, most linear performance of all other modulators. Whereas for, and perhaps they're also using wireless communications quite a bit actually. Whereas for data center, the cost is driving everything people use mainly, as, as I understand now, in the phosphate and silicon photonics. And so our goal was, can we actually enable this long haul performance at the cost of silicon photonics uh, and uh, realize modulators in lithium ion that would be cost effective, but also that could be driven directly by CMOS voltages. What mean I, I mean by that, uh, normally if I wanna drive a modulator in, shown by Max Zender here, uh, using some signal from a microprocessor, because typically a lithium ion modulator uh, uh, have very large VPI voltage, you need to essentially boost the signal. You need some RF amplifiers, which increases the cost and size, energy consumption, and everything. So the question was, can we actually reduce VPI modulator so that it can be driven directly by signals from microprocessor? This would give you low energy consumption. And, and in order to improve upon silicon photonics, so silicon photonics is very cheap but his huge insertion loss because silicon is not good electroptic material. So in order to get the electroptic modulation, you need to use carrier dispersion, which comes at the expense of carrier absorption, free carrier absorption. So essentially big insertion loss. And so we wanted to see, can we actually have low energy operation, low insertion loss, high bandwidth and everything integrated on the same chip. And basically the answer is yes. Uh, and for that, we leverage the fact that we can make very, low loss, very highly efficient optical waveguides in lithium ion by etching lithium ion And so then what we did essentially do a little more, more engineering. And so uh, we realized these Max Zender interferometer based modulators. So you have essentially a uh, blue line, dark blue lines are lithium ion waveguides. They're surrounded by RF electrodes. These are traveling wave electrodes uh, uh, for the reason uh, that I explained uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is cross section of one of the modulators. Um, Purple is lithium niobate, or this pink is lithium niobate. From, uh, these are gold electrodes. Between them is five to seven microns, depending on what we're trying to optimize for. This is numerical modeling that shows that uh, RF fields show with arrows have very nice overlap with optical signal, um, which is shown in, in this kind of color uh, 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 gradient. Okay. 
Uh, and that allows us to get very nice electroptic efficiency. And indeed, when we looked at what is the V pi voltage, what is the voltage needed to turn this modulator from on to, sorry, from off to on, okay, uh, we, uh, uh, we were able to do this with only 1.4 volts, which is maybe factor three or so, maybe two to three better than, uh, <clears throat> better than what you can do uh, with conventional lithium ion batteries, which to be honest, at the time didn't seem a lot, but actually when we talked to uh, uh, Nokia friends uh, and also Joe Kahn at Stanford, they really point out that if you can push this further to below volt, where it's CMOS voltages are, this is actually really, really big deal because you don't need to have these RF amplifiers, as I mentioned. And stiction ratio of these devices was 30 dB, and we were really excited at that time. So basically, it means this guy's off, then it's 30 dB off. Now we actually understand that probably this is even better, and this was limited by actually uh, amplified spontaneous emission from the laser that we used, we think, uh, that was broadband. So we are actually now following up some experiments uh, to confirm this. And insertion loss of this device, on-chip insertion loss was sub 0.5 dB, 0.1 to 0.5, depending on electrode placement. I mentioned uh, another very important feature, which is maybe subtle, but only for those people who are familiar with traditional lithium ion modulator uh, may appreciate this. Uh, lithium ion has very large epsilon, uh, so a very large electric constant, and therefore it's very hard to phase, group velocity and phase match optical and RF field. Uh, turns out that this thin film lithium ion this is actually relatively straightforward, simply by controlling the thickness of silicon dioxide. We were able to generate, get into position where the RF and optical field have matched phase and group velocity. Uh, and uh, as a result, the bandwidth of the modulator should be unlimited. And indeed, we were able to demonstrate 100 gigahertz bandwidth with Peter Vince's group. This was done in collaboration with Nokia, who provided some equipment. Um, and uh, the reason why we could, but bandwidth was limited, was that, that these electrodes have actually finite microwave loss. So you cannot make electrodes very, very long, which would drive VPI down, but because of microwave loss, actually, that puts a limit of how far you can go. So as you can see already here, five millimeter device, five millimeter long modulator that has higher VPI operates at 100 gigahertz, whereas two centimeter long device has smaller VPI, 1.4 volt, but only operates up to 40 gigahertz. And this is due to microwave loss, basically. Since then, the company that we started actually has pushed these, has generated, shipped some of these modulators to customers who have measured hundreds of gigahertz, three to 400 gigahertz actually uh, modulation bandwidth uh, with pretty decent PPI. So this is actually looking uh, quite nice. Uh, what we did wanted actually uh, to check that indeed we can do data transfer using these modulators uh, using CMOS compatible voltages. So for example, so this was done in collaboration with Peter Winter and his team at was still in Nokia Bell Labs. And so basically they just took CMOS DAC put wires directly to lithium ion modulator we provided and they were able to get nice communication with nice open diagram and nice constellation with bit error rate below what they could detect with only 200 millivolts of uh, peak to peak voltage uh, and in, in fact what they also did they put attenuator here and they were able to send data that is uh, error correctable with only 60 millivolts which is roughly translates to 40 attitudes per bit and so this is on chip consumption of course this is somewhat misleading because if I take one kilowatt laser here, it's an input, I could reduce, my signal to noise is gonna be much better, right? So uh, I can use much, much less electrical energy to actually do communication. So what's really important to look into is overall consumption, laser power, detector power, and modulator power. But for on-chip devices, this is what people use to compare. So we, we decided to compare uh, to, 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 in order to provide fair comparison, essentially we're just showing these on-chip losses, uh, uh, on-chip energy consumption to, to do the data transfer. Other things that we also did, we also uh, said, uh, used uh, kind of uh, 70 gigabaud uh, uh, device uh, and were able to send three bit per symbol, uh, which gave us at, at the time, and this was record for integrated modulator 210 gigabit per second. Uh, and since then, actually, Nokia and Hyperlight have demonstrated using single modulator uh, more than 700 gigabit per second data rates. Uh, it was actually a post paper on ECOC uh, uh, last fall. So this is, I think, a moment record for, and this is without polarization. This is just single lane, single wavelength, 
single modulator, uh, 700 gigabit per second. So using similar similar modulators. Uh, maybe I'll skip this slide. So how do we compare, how does this technology compare to, uh, for example, other integrated photonics technologies? Well, uh, as I mentioned, silicon is most widely known uh, as a kind of integrated modular solution. And as I mentioned, it has a problem that it has large insertion loss because it's really not good electronic material in order to make uh, electro-optic phase modulator, which then you use to make amplitude modulator, you need to inject carrier and that comes with expense of uh, free carrier absorption. So if you wanna reduce the voltage of silicon modulator uh, from let's say 10 volts to three volts, you need to dope it more and more, you need to inject more and more carriers and then losses, insertion losses go up. And these are on-chip insertion losses. Uh, in the, uh, our modulator on the other hand doesn't have this trade-off. On the other hand, our modulator is much bigger than silicon modulator. So it really depends what, what is, uh, uh, what is the figure of merit that uh, some uh, user needs, right? And other platforms actually, uh, I think any phosphate uh, uh, modulators are still actually uh, looking really good and perhaps are the biggest, or rather the, the, the biggest not competitor, but like the kind of the, the technology that we should be comparing these internet with uh, uh, modulators against. Um, uh, so both are actually going, going strong, I would say. And you know, there's some other, other devices, for example, cosmonics and whatnot, uh, can have extremely low loss, really low VPI, uh, so extremely high loss, very low VPI, but the device, these devices can be very short. So maybe that's okay for certain applications uh, as well. Okay, so uh, what we were then interested in was really this idea of using frequency column to further increase the data rate uh, 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 communication rates. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the idea is to use frequency comm and then, and this was not our idea, this is to me the first work I've seen an integrated photonics community with uh, Tobias Kipperberg and uh, Christian Kuss, uh, probably many, many before them have done this with optical fibers and more traditional electropic frequency comms. But the idea is to you put you pump the frequency comb with one color of light to generate this frequency comb, and then you filter each of these comb feet and you modulate it and then recombine it. Uh, and you, you use very kind of dense level division multiplexing approach to have very high aggregate data rates. And it's, but instead of actually this actual, uh, instead of Kerr effect that uh, I showed you before, what you wanted to do was electroptic modulator. Because in fact, actually, electroptic. Electro-optic frequency combs were among the first frequency comb demonstrated before uh, even modular lasers, uh, certainly before these kind of Kerr combs. Um, and the way you make a frequency comb out of elect uh, electro-optic modulator, just take phase modulator, drive it harder and harder and generate side bends. And basically this side bend gives you frequency comb. And spacing between these different side bends is determined by RF signal that you apply. And so here is like, we just used one of our phase modulators and this is known, people have published this a lot of and use this a lot uh, using conventional standalone lithium-ion modulator. Here we used our integrated modulator that because of its low VPI, we could actually modulate very, very strongly and generate many different, I think it's just 30 gigahertz uh, electropic comp uh, with many, many, uh, many lines. The problem of this comp was that it was not flat at all. As you can see here, this, this kind of division is 20 dB per division. So, so these theta are essentially, you know, essentially 10 dB away. So this is not very good. If you want to use this for communication, you want this comp to be as flat as possible. Fortunately, these technologies are known. These approaches to, to make comps flat are known. Again, here's some work, I think it's Scott Didams, yeah, it's Scott Pop's work, Andy Viner has some very nice work in this space. But basically what you do, you take intensity modulator, two phase modulators. This was done with these speed components. And then by controlling how you drive them, you, actually, you can actually flatten the comp as shown here. And then uh, in this case, because they use discrete components, there's a lot of insertion loss, 3 dB each time you go to one modulator. So it's like from here to here, but 9 dB. So they need to have amplifier to overcome that. And then it goes through nonlinear fiber, some wave shaping, and they can get these really, really nice flat comps. So we wanted to do all of these things, but one chip and with much more, uh, more energy efficient rate. So here's our solution. Uh, this is an unpublished uh, uh, work from my postdoc MJ, who is actually on job market interview with left and right, not right now. Uh, so the so device basically has, uh, this is input, it has one amplitude modulator uh, shown here. 
uh, and then it has one phase modulator, but we go to this phase modulator twice. Uh, so essentially the same configuration as this, this one, but Scott, 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 and Scott. And then this device also has integrated lithium ion with waveguide for pulse compression. Uh, so that we don't have to have optical fiber. Uh, unfortunately, this part at the moment is still a little lossy because we need to use much thinner lithium ion with waveguide. So there's a lot of like, roughness when you're working on that. But in the meantime, we also have replaced this integrated lithium ion with waveguide with uh, still using highly nonlinear fiber. Uh, and so, so here's the spectrum. So this is the comb we generated uh, with very little. So we use our low EPI modulators. We have 67 comb lines, and this is 30 gigahertz comb essentially. It's really, really flat. This is now the same comb plot in a linear scale. So you can see that basically these kind of combs in the comb line in the middle are essentially exactly the same power. Uh, and then with a little bit of wave shaping, we can actually also bring these guys down. So if the further increase the fat flatness. This, this comp has actually excellent conversion of uh, pump to comp conversion efficiency, about 25%. Little known fact about curve frequency comp that conversion efficiency is very small, like around three to 5%. So this is you know, more efficient way to generate frequency comp. And also even this device already generates uh, pulses. And then when we send it through uh, nonlinear fiber, we can get very nice femtosecond pulses. So basically what this is, you send CW light in, uh, onto this lithium ion modulator, you modulate it, you have a little bit of fiber, which you're hoping to replace with, uh, with on chip waveguide, as I mentioned, to, for compression, and you get femtosecond source out of it. So, we actually have used this femtosecond source already in our, in our lab as a, as a source for nonlinear optics experiments. We have used this to excite uh, periodic pole lithium ion wave, generate supercontinuum out of it, and whatnot. So, it has enough energy to actually do something useful. Uh, so, uh, you know, but, uh, th th this is work is being wrapped up for, for publication. Uh, another way that to, to further increase the bandwidth of the comp that uh, has been known for a while in the community is to actually combine phase modulator with optical cavity. So then if optical cavity gives you these resonances that are separated by free spectra spectral range, and if you modulate uh, the phase modulator, the frequency that's the same as free spectrum range, you can get this cascaded process of sideband generation that's enhanced by the cavity resonance. And there was a lot of work done with kind of standalone bulk modulator inside of the cavity, or this is done by Joe Kahn at Stanford. Uh, you have phase modulator inside fiber cavity and those things work, but bandwidth is always limited. Uh, uh, so what we decided to do essentially take one of our ring resonators and put phase modulator inside a ring resonator. And so this is optical waveguide ring resonator. This is uh, this actually cavity has yeah, the size of 10 gigahertz. And then we were able to drive it at 10 gigahertz and generate nice 10 gigahertz comb. Uh, this comb, unlike Kirk comb, does not, you know, works at any optical powers because this is actually linear. Optical is linear process. It's optics plus RF. So as, as soon as you turn RF, you start generating pulses out of this gut. There's no fancy locking stabilization. It just give, it immediately gives you pulses. That's very nice. Another nice thing is you can take the same device and drive it in 20, 30, 40 gigahertz or so, and you can generate comb with multiples of free spectrum range as shown here. So this is also uh, pretty cool. But still, the bandwidth, while it was wider than the bandwidth of our kind of AM, PM uh, frequency comb shown in the last few slides, uh, this kind of roll off uh, uh, was not very good. So, uh, you know, like oops, you get this is 20 dB per division. So, you know, I mean, it is broader, but still, it's not really, really flat comb. And the problems are actually several. First, dispersion engineering here wasn't done properly. So, we now have better wave, lithium ion waveguide designs that, in theory, should give you very broad comb. And second one is subtle that I was hoping to tell you a little more about, but I'm going to skip it maybe in the interest of time. And then if there's a question, come back to this. And second one is essentially <clears throat> that actually modulation, and uh, uh, it, it, you kind of want to drive this optical resonator hard in order to generate more sidebands. But it turns out the harder you drive it, the more difficult it becomes to put light inside. And, and this is subtle, but here's why. If I just make ring resonator and measure its transmission, I get this blue dip. And we, we spend a lot of time to kind of uh, make sure this ring resonator is critically coupled to the waveguide. But then when you start driving with RF, actually, you take light out of the pump 
and generate sideband. And this is effectively a loss mechanism for the pump. So essentially more RF introduces more losses, effective losses to the, to the resonator. And then the resonator becomes severely undercoupled. And that's why these dips uh, become smaller and smaller and harder to drive it, the, the, the more difficult it becomes to put light inside. And that's what limits actually comb bandwidth. And, and moreover, these then dips don't, don't look like Lorentzian. And you can think about it's essentially resonance is moving left and right within the photon lifetime. So you have some sort of average. Uh, that's one way to think about it. It's kind of average kind of effect. Another much nicer way to think about this is actually, I'm gonna show briefly on the next slide and then I'm gonna skip that part probably just to go to the last part of the presentation. We actually overcome this recently. I'm not, I'm not showing you data by actually using two coupled ring resonators where we use one ring resonator as a dynamical, dynamic coupler, if you will, which we can choose. So, so essentially adjusts critical, essentially it, it adjusts itself so that you're always critically coupled to the EO comb resonator as you're driving it harder and harder. It's actually pretty cool. So you're always critically coupled. You can always put more light. And we were able to show that we can significantly increase conversion efficiency for about 5% to 30% using this process. I, I, unfortunately, we've we actually published theory work with Joe Kahn again on this, and now we have experimental data to confirm that as well. Uh, but this process is actually pretty cool. So this process of comb generation inside a resonator is basically a random walk, if you will, in frequency domain. So what photon does when you apply RF is copying left and right for one frequency mode to another, which is equivalent of having sending photon to beam splitter. So essentially, each time you apply RF, you get a uh, photon, you know, if, if photons are sitting here, it can go left or it can go right. So it's random walk, experiences random walk in frequency domain. Uh, and therefore it turns out uh, you can think about this process as in tight binding formalism that essentially your resonances of the resonator corresponds to some sort of crystal lattices. And then you have free electron in our case is photon that's hopping in this kind of background, this lattice. But what's really cool is that, and, uh, uh, and maybe not so obvious to see right away, if I apply two RF signals that are slightly detuned from one another, I actually know photon has two different ways to go from one resonance to another, and effectively has experiences two-dimensional random walk, which is equivalent to actually two RF signals spanning two-dimensional lattice in frequency domain. And if I apply three RF signals, I'm actually kind of photon has experiencing it's walking in equivalent three-dimensional lattice. And if I have four RF signals, it's four-dimensional lattice. And we went up to four, and then we ran out away WGs in our lab. So we didn't go to five, six dimensions, whatnot. But then when you do transmission measurement, sorry, my bad, transmission measurement with one RF, two RF, three RF, four RF, these transmission resonances uh, actually uh, turns out when you do theory, there's a one on to one mapping of measuring transmission through RF modulator resonator with measuring density of states in one, two, three, or four dimensional crystal that we kind of uh, uh, have in the synthetic space uh, that's projected, uh, expand, uh, that is uh, described by these like RF, RF sources. Another thing is if you kind of, if RF source is tuned to FSR, you indeed you get this random walk. And if you are slightly detuned, you have you, you, your photon experiences boundaries in the frequency domain. So it looks a little bit like block oscillation. And we have actually went further and really generated real kind of frequency domain boundaries for photons, which in turn ended up. So photon cannot, this process cannot go forever. Photon hops up to a point and then hits the boundary and starts reflecting back in frequency domain, which essentially increases the efficiency of comb generation in this smaller bandwidth, right? So either we generate broad comb with low power per comb tooth or narrow comb with a lot of power using these boundaries, which is also pretty cool and some work in progress. Uh, uh, I know I'm kind of running a little low on time. I'll try maybe in the last three, four minutes to tell you <laughs> quite a few things, uh, but maybe just uh, uh, some highlights. So, so everything I said so far was like along the lines of actually, uh, modulation, basically, electro-optic modulation. Um, uh, so you take modulator, you drive it hard, you put some sidebands, and you generate like these kind of frequency counts. But the question is, can we 
the get rid of these sidebands, can we make truly like single sidebar modulator, which has many applications in RF communica uh, communication, or can we use this uh, to this kind of process to realize frequency shifter, which would be a device that takes, uh, you put one color of light in, you apply RF, and you shift all the photons at that frequency to different frequency. And, and this shift is basically the same as frequency of the RF. We went up to 40 gig, which is what we have in the lab, but in principle can be you know, anywhere really. The device we use for that are these photonic molecules, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about them, uh, unfortunately, but it's actually probably the most exciting part uh, of what we're doing these days. So these are two ring resonators made in lithium hybrid, topical lithium hybrid waveguide with RF electrodes. And basically what happens when you have a single ring resonator measure transmission, you have like this resonator dips. When you couple two ring resonators, each of these dips splits in two, you get doublets and you can think about this as essentially super, super modes into a couple of quantum wells. And so what you have now two resonances of these two super modes and we apply microwave signals and we can go from one resonance to another. And so this action indeed behaves like molecule because it's a nice electrophilic effect. If you apply DC bias to our, these two resonators, we can actually shift the resonance splitting as shown here, this experimental data with zero bias splitting is maybe like 12 gigahertz here, or maybe the last nine gigahertz. And when we apply bias, uh, actually the splitting increases. Uh, so if one goes here, the other one goes there. So you can use this to tune the splitting. You can also uh, see kind of uh, uh, auto splitting. If you have AC stack effect, if you're driving the system on resonance with RF, uh, you you know, it's like dress state picture or, or this uh, uh, AT, uh, uh, AT splitting essentially. So basically you split each of these resonances due to strong uh, RF drive. Or another way to think about this is we put light photons in one of the resonances. Let's say this guy and apply RF, and essentially we have Rabi oscillation going on between these two resonances. And how long you can do this is determined by photon lifetime inside the resonator. And so to make frequency shifter, basically now what we wanted to do, we wanted to interrupt this rapid process somehow. And the way to do this is actually very, very simple, but actually I think really clever. It was done by my student Yao Wen. So he figured out that by controlling coupling between waveguide which is continuum of modes in, in this picture, but essentially controlling coupling between the waveguide, between waveguide and the ring, between ring and ring, and between this ring and the waveguide again, by controlling these three coupling rates, you can actually get this process to self-terminate, meaning you interact Rabi oscillation after like one equivalent pi pulse. So if you put light in one frequency after, you can just drive it in continuous wave RF and photons will always come in different frequency. And so Yavin indeed showed this experimentally. So if you design the system properly, this experimental data, you pump, put photon here, light inside this double ring resonance system here, apply RF, all the photons end up in this other frequency, here splitting between two resonators was 12 gigahertz. And also if you actually put light in the higher frequency, omega two and apply RF, all the photon goes to lower frequency. And the sufficiency of this shift is about 90%, uh, 99% and insertion loss is very, very low. And so this is how you can make frequency shifter. Also using this, you can make actually beam splitter. If I control how much RF power I apply, I don't have to convert all the light from one mode into the other mode. I can get 50% of light to, to like uh, be converted to the other mode, which is essentially equivalent to making uh, beam frequency the main beam splitter. So as demonstrated here, so basically it's experimental data. If I, uh, I put light in this resonance, this is different device, it has 30 gigahertz splitting between the rings. Uh, so I put light here, I uh, don't apply any RF, all light stay in this mode. If I apply a lot of RF, all the light goes to the other resonance. If I apply just about 10 dBm, I split amount of power in each of these resonances, it's 50-50 split ratio. It turns out by controlling the phase of microwave and the phase of, uh, 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 microwave power and controlling microwave power and microwave phase, we can actually perform unitary transform uh, on, uh, on optical pulses. And this was done with coherent field, but basically now you can start thinking about this as essentially frequency domain beam splitter that could be of interest, frequency domain quantum computing. And I'm not really doing justice to this work at all, but this is uh, some work uh, that we are trying to implement uh, following some ideas from Joe Wilkins and Pavel Lugoski and Diviner and a few others that basically proposed that using 
very fast electroptic modulators, wave shapers, and another electroptic modulator, you can actually do frequency domain linear quantum linear optical quantum computing essentially, where you are really leveraging wide bandwidth of photons. It's a lot more resource friendly than path encoding qubit implementations, for example. Uh, the main problem in, in the approach is that they use EOMs, and EOM generates many sidebands. Our approach generally works only on two sidebands, essentially. So you can extend it by putting more rings, uh, but you know uh, there are some other subtleties uh, and, and that one needs to consider with working with ring resonators. Uh, I will just say that this same same kind of same ring resonator structure, a couple of ring resonators we are using in collaboration with uh, Carl Bergen and as of recently Dirk England through uh, Psychat's ERC, we are using to make microwave optical transducers. Uh, that will be used to take signal from a superconducting qubit and convert it, which is a microwave frequency, and take it to optical frequency. At the moment, efficiency of this process is 10 to negative 5 in published work. This is not very good, but there's very simple improvements that we can make that will this bring us basically to, to a fidelity of 1. After this was published, there was uh, work uh, by us and uh, uh, Mission 5 and at Stanford at the same time. Uh, since then, Hong Teng Group at Yale actually demonstrated significant improvements over this result using the same lithium nibit double coupled rings. They demonstrated one percent conversion efficiency. So, so now as 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 a as community, we're working going further. And in particular, we're excited by some of these ideas we developed in collaboration with Rigetti and Dirk, where basically we want to do spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, and generate one telecom or one microwave photon, store one microwave photon in superconducting qubit. And then send telecom photons over a distance and tangle them, and we kind of then um, uh, using teleport essentially to, uh, to kind of uh, get information across. This is a lot more efficient and resource friendly, we think, approach than doing this direct conversion that we originally planned to do. This brings me to the conclusion. Uh, I told you a little bit about optical nonlinearities, microwave plus optical nonlinearities. Uh, uh, just just as, as a highlight, uh, we are really pushing microwave photonics angle here. We have I'm leading DARPA Lumos program on integrating lasers and detectors to really make uh, kind of a very complex RF uh, processor uh, uh, that leverages electroptics and lithium ion bit. And uh, equally, we are excited about actually uh, using this platform in our Center for Quantum Networks with SciCat and others to address the needs of basically quantum internet be it and the kind of heralded single photon sources or uh, you know multiplex repeaters or quantum frequency transducers that I mentioned uh, earlier and just briefly to thank collaborators and thank you for your attention great thanks a lot marco i wish i could clap in person <laughs> I, I, of course, have tons of questions, but I would like to, so I don't see any questions in the chat window. I would like to ask everybody to try to mimic real-time operation as much as possible to either raise your hand with your video on or click on the reactions button and use the raise hand feature. Um, either way, Masood, go ahead. You're muted, Masood. Masood, you're muted. I think you mentioned early on, how do you get these thin layers of lithium niobate on silicon dioxide? Yeah. Could you explain that again? I, I missed that part. Yeah, I briefly mentioned, we actually buy it. The way we get it, they send thousand dollars to China and we get away from back. But the way they do it, they it's ion slicing. So they take bulk lithium niobate, they do a smarter process, same thing as you do for silicon. They implant with the uh, hydrogen, uh, uh, with protons, I think, or helium. Actually, I forgot what they do. And they damage the layer uh, at the low surface. And then they actually put a little bit of oxide, do oxide oxide bonding. And then they thermally stress it and get rid of, uh, of the substrate and do some polishing. And in principle, you can bond it to sapphire, quartz, whatever you want. It's actually a process that I think Rick Osgood developed in Columbia. In fact, when I was postdoc in Capasso Lab, I used some of Rick's devices, but the problem Rick's devices were like this big. These guys are like, <laughs> You know, like six six inch uh, wafers. Uh, uh, Tom, go ahead. Hey, hey, Marco, great talk. Um, Thanks. Uh, when you were doing the really low energy um, modulation, um, I was surprised that you didn't um, talk about ring modulators as, as an even a pathway to even lower energy. Um, did uh, you're obviously doing ring modulation and all these sophisticated uh, processing you're doing later on? So. Um, no, uh, no results with uh, standalone ring modulators. So we do. Uh, 
this paper actually has ring modulator. I don't have, uh, this is ring modulator by the way. This is from that paper. We did do ring modulator based, uh, ring based modulator, but this is what we kind of, you know, we went and talked to people who would be users and most users at a time, we talked to people in Google, especially with Hypes, the company was started. They said they don't want to deal with ring modulators because they need to tune it. They want to just use Max Zenders. And then now some people came to us that they want really, really low power, uh, you know, for reduced power to like, you know, some volts. And then you need to go to modular route. And we also talked to Karen Bergen. Uh, they do obviously these bunch of rings in silicon on, on a daisy chain or an optical waveguide. But the way they do it, I think that that's an interesting question. They are going for many channels, many modulators, but low speed. Uh, so for us, I think we're going we're operating a different regime. We can go very fast with single modulator, but then the question is, can electronics keep up? So it's, a, I mean, it's system level design, I think that I don't have a good answer. <laughs> and one, one other question that on the quantum stuff, I, it's pretty clear you, there's no, uh, no room for optical gain on these things, but for some of the other applications, are you messing around with uh, erbium doping or anything like that? So, so we, in DARPA Lumos program, we are putting uh, uh, lasers. We need to generate one watt with like some obscenely narrow line width. And we need to have amplifiers on chip for this kind of to be uh, responsive. Uh, so we are doing that. We are kind of close to having this done. Actually, we can fortunately cannot do John Bauer's approach because of we need to have one watt. So we need to have vertical injection through the laser. There is, you know, otherwise it, the resistance is too large. Uh, so this is some kind of butt coupling kind of hybrid approach. It's, it's a little, you know, a little, a little more manual maybe. Uh, there were, there was my former student Chang actually put a paper on archive. They put, they made urban doped modulator and lithium iodide. And I know that Edo Vox is working with Urbium and lithium iodide. I think it was Urbium or maybe Tulium for uh, quantum memories. We also look into this for purpose of quantum memories, but we, we are not pushing it very hard at the moment. Okay. That's an option for sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sure. Anybody else has a question? Um, Hi. Uh, Hi. Hi, Marco. I, uh, thank you for the great presentation and uh, these are very impressive results. So I have a question. Um, so um, regarding the, the last part of your talk, when you talk about the in entanglement between microwave photons and the uh, optical photon. Mm -hmm. uh, so could you describe a bit more about the configuration? Because I think it would be a very useful architecture. Because I can, I also talk about the, uh, you know, gen a directly generation of uh, uh, microwave and uh, optical entanglement. Right, right. So normally, what, yeah. So what we want normally wanted to do, we want a direct transduction. With you would pump on red, like red photon. Uh, you would you put put it at uh, this frequency, and then you would eat up one microwave photon and scatter essentially, you know, one of the photons into the second resonance, right? So mm -hmm. instead of we can do the way we envision this to work uh, for this SPDC process, pump here and then generate one of these guys and one microwave photon. So it's like, uh, uh, yeah, SPDC basically, yeah. Yep. And then basically this one would go into superconducting qubit be stored or, or some mechanical resonator, a loss of painter or something like that, mm -hmm. where this guy would travel uh, and then meet with another mm -hmm. photon from the fridge. Uh, yeah, I, so actually what, what, what we had in mind was uh, just uh, something opposite, right? So you send, the, send out the microwave photon for some sort of uh, radar type of application for yes. remote sensing, but then you locally store the optical photon probably just being a spool of optical fibers and- uh, Oh, so it's SPDC, but you send microwave out. Yeah, so yeah. you know of this um, work we did, like Jeff and I did many years ago on quantum illumination with uh, entangled photon source using SPDC. I mean, what recently what we are finding is that uh, the real con ops of that, I mean, the, the classical quantum improvement is actually when you are in a high noise regime and it supports microwave operation, but we need to be able to generate that microwave photon entanglement and Zeshen built this receiver that when he was at MIT that involves a parametric process between the target return signal and the stored idler. And uh, we believe that this technology might be useful to do that. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, 
Sounds good. I mean, what, what are you saying? Like, uh, do you want to work together? Is that what you're saying? Or are you? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, uh, there's, we have received a lot of actually inquiries from different uh, communities about um, this little kind of molecular thing. There's the people who want to do, I think, radio astronomy. Uh, it's apparently problem to make a detector. They want to do frequency up conversion. And so they are already trying to do some kind of RF terahertz to to optical, and it turns out this is very efficient way based on what they, we were told to do this. Um, we I didn't I never thought about sending microwave out. So this is yeah, this is great. Uh, Masoud, you. you mentioned that um, your electro optic modulator, the data rate uh, currently is limited by the by the microwave circuit. And I think you mentioned that you have gone as high as what, 400 gigahertz, 400 gigabit per second, right? Uh, so we we got 200, we got 210 gigabit the most we did, uh, and Hyperlight did 700 gigabit per second. Yeah, company, yeah. 700 gigabit for single mo for single modulator. Yeah. Now, suppose that uh, you could overcome the microwave circuitry limit. Uh, is there an uh, upper limit uh, that lithium, lithium niobate itself imposes ah, on the data rate? I'd say that's a good question. I mean, essentially, how fast is electro optic coefficient? Is that what you mean? Like, how fast is Popper's effect? I mean, this is, uh, I, th I think it's sub per second. I, I don't know, to be honest. I mean, this is, I haven't looked into this. Usually terahertz, yeah. Terahertz, yeah. But what's the, what's the physical mechanism for the electro-optic modulation inside lithium niobate? Is there any mechanical motion of the atoms involved or is it no. all electronic motion? It's electronic motion. More questions? So Marco, I, I have one. I, when I was listening to that, um, your, your car cavity stuff, you know, I, uh, I got reminded of this work from uh, Michel Devere, I was in Nature like recently, um, where they did this, um, uh, inserted this superconducting nonlinear inductive element inside a standard 3D transmont qubit cavity to um, generate uh, cap states inside uh, those resonators. And it was a pretty cool experiment. And I was wondering if I mean, it looks like you have everything you need in your cavity and looking at your car strength numbers that wondering if one could do that in optical frequencies using these devices. I'm not from, I haven't, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I haven't followed the paper, so. I will, uh, I'll put this in the chat window. This is pretty recent, just came uh, out in nature. Cool. Yeah, we, we can talk more about it if you want. Yeah, but okay. uh, yeah, we are thinking quite a lot um, between Zesh and me and Linran here on a non-Gaussian um, state sure. generation variety of applications. And um, it looks like your photonic cavities, I mean, especially the nonlinear curse strings are, and the losses are getting to a point where we might be able to do some of these crazy things that people do in superconducting resonators traditionally in um, optical, um, sure. in optical domain. I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I, I would have to take a look. I mean, we, what our dream is, and you may remember this little workshop we had with Tatiana and mm -hmm. conversation we had there. I mean, we are maybe 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 a factor of fifty, maybe hundred in these devices away from having single photon linearities. Uh, uh, which, by the way, we may be able to overcome by periodically pulling uh, maybe these things to kind of enhance mm -hmm. linearities. So this is then you could really start. Incorporating these Hamiltonians or superconducting qubit in an optical domain, which would be pretty cool. But uh, we recently had some work with Tobias Kimperberg to try to estimate what is the material limit of, of this thin film platform. We at the moment think it's on the order of 60 million, which is not, it's a little bit disappointing maybe. And we don't know if this is, well, actually, there's few reasons. One is this is congruent lithium nitrate, it's not stoichiometric, so we need to probably get better lithium nitrate. Second, this process of ion implantation probably causes some issues. So cues that people demonstrated in JPL using polished lead to was about 100 times better than we have. 
Wow. Mm -hmm. There is hope, but these are both spheres. These, you know, so material should be able, if we get good material, to go high. So that's another direction and maybe, maybe also useful for what you were saying. I see. Interesting. Mm -hmm. By the way, I have some update for you later. We can talk about that DARPA um, workshop. There's some activity happening there. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I also talked to Tatiana, actually. I think she was recently. So awesome. yeah, let's catch up on that. Any That's more good. questions for Marco? Um, I have one more since nobody's asking, I'm gonna just hog up my time because, so your last part on the quantum frequency processor, we, so Lin Ran Fan, who is not here today, he and I are collaborating with- He's uh, here, I see him, I see him there. Is Lin Ran here? Uh, I don't- uh, Yeah, sorry, oh, really? I was delayed by something else. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay. No, no, no worries. I, I, you know, Lin Ran Marco, I don't know if you heard about that last part on the quantum frequency processor they, and his reference to the Oak Ridge work. Hmm. And, um, you know, we, so Linran and I are currently working with Oak Ridge and especially Joe Lukens and others um, on uh, potentially using uh, their technique, this, uh, that flip flops between this phase, electrical phase modulation and the, you know, the, 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 the dispersive element to, uh, and some work that Linran is doing on uh, generating multi-mode um, squeeze states on the, on a frequency comb to uh, and mode resolved frequency mode resolved photon detection to generate GKP qubits. I mean, this is a crazy idea that is right now only in, in, in out there in theory that came from some theorists in Xanadu and some others uh, and our, our group has also done some work on that. So we were, I was wondering what are the pros and cons of using that approach versus your approach? I mean, they're both universal in the sense of being able to do arbitrary beam splitter like interactions across a set of frequencies. You mean continue? You, this is a continuous variable. What you are saying? Or? Well, this the, no. yeah the state, the state itself is continuous variable, but it lives on a discrete set of frequencies. Oh, and, oh, I see. So this is people have done these. <clears throat> I remember Roberto Morandotti had these kind of almost cluster states also in different set of frequencies using frequency comb below threshold basically. Is that is that what you mean? Right. Um. Do you know of Olivia Fister's work? Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know, I know some, not all. Of Sure. So think of what so what Olivia is doing in a bulk um, OPO crystal. Linran is doing that in a basically it's a similar mm. type of goal, but he's working on a nanophotonic platform. And yeah, I don't. It, yeah, I don't know uh, to be honest uh, what uh, what would be better. To be maximally honest, once we had this modulator, <laughs> we were trying to figure out what can we do with it, and it seemed to be. Uh, like these guys were some, we talked to Joel quite a bit actually, we know him well. Uh, and they were interested in higher frequencies, easier filtering and all that stuff, integrating multiple. So, so we didn't, I wouldn't say that we went for, let's see what's the best implementation uh, and, and then pursue that. It was more like Joel got this excited. So we started thinking, we're, we're, he's collaborating with us on this actually. Uh, so I don't know, I, I, I would have to become a little more familiar with uh, what you're uh, discussing. Maybe dinner, if you want to send me an email or something with a uh, uh, paper, we can chat. Yeah. yeah, sure. I can probably follow up with some papers, then we can yeah. from there. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. More questions for Marco at this time. If we were in person, we'd probably go outside in our third floor open area and grab a cup of coffee. And um, would love to host you in person, Marco, sometime in this colloquium. Uh, sounds, sounds like a plan. I do like coming to Tucson. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a good crowd, it's better, better. <laughs> so, yeah, it's hopefully soon. Right? Are you guys all vaccinated now or are you? We are so. The, interestingly enough, the state of Arizona considers all of us here in the as a priority. Right. Yeah, we are in what Arizona states phase one B one. So I think almost all the university should be fully vaccinated by now. Wow, that's nice. Yeah, we are not priority here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. All right. Any more questions? I'm just gonna go once, twice, thrice. All right, let us uh, thank all Marco. Well, uh, was, I don't know, was Judy gonna do her, uh, sometimes she does her, her meet and greet thing, I don't know. Oh, Judy, go, go ahead, all floor is yours. Oh, yeah, it just uh, depends on how interested the students are. So typically I, I 
save the end for if students want to introduce themselves to you yes. or if uh, you know, I ask see. a question. That's I see not... people dropping off, as you said, that that's not <laughs> <laughs> So maybe wait, see, uh, do any students want to introduce themselves to Marco? Maybe ask him a question that's not necessarily technically related to the talk. So just, you know, turn on your video and ask. Okay. Yeah, if not, it's pretty late over there, so. There's no student. I was just hey, saying, hey, how, how are you? you? <laughs> yeah, all right, good seeing you. Yeah, thanks. I guess we've got a shy bunch. Yeah, so. Looks like it. Yeah, we really appreciate you taking. Yeah, time. thank you so much. Yeah, this was fun. Okay. Let's see right. a lot of friends. I don't see like it enough, so it was great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're looking forward to getting you out here again sometimes. So. Absolutely, yeah. it'll be my pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, Marco. Good to see you. Hey, good to see you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.